Good afternoon. It's good to see you all. There's nowhere else that I'd rather be right now than listening to this panel of experts talk about a problem that is on all of our minds. And it's a great honor and privilege to be here uh, listening to their remarks on um, Russia and Ukraine. My name is Dr. Daniel A. Morris, and I'll be the moderator for today. It's my job right now and uh, my pleasure to introduce our panel. And then um, after the panel, we'll have uh, remarks from our respondent and a time for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Um, so I will just begin by introducing uh, the, the individuals that you see on the stage before you, starting uh, here to my immediate left with Dr. Nicholas K. Gvostev. Dr. Gvostev is Professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval War College and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He holds non-residential fellowships with the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, and he is a member of the Loisach Group, which is a collaboration between the Munich Security Conference and the Marshall Center to enhance U.S. and Germany's security partnership. He's a contributing editor for the National Interest, and he has taught at Baylor, Georgetown, George Washington, Harvard Extension, and Brown Universities. Uh, next, we have Dr. Angela Kaczewski, who is an associate professor of political science at Arcadia University in suburban Philadelphia. Her research falls in the fields of conflict resolution and critical security studies, and she focuses on divided societies, societies identity boundaries, and Russian-speaking minorities in Ukraine, the Baltic states, and Moldova. Next, we have Dr. Lasha Chantarise, who is a professor and director of the graduate programs in diplomacy and international relations. He earned his PhD in international re relations from Queen's University of Kingston, Ontario. And his research interests are at the intersection of diplomacy and force international politics. And his academic publications are in the areas of geopolitics, Russian foreign policy, Canadian foreign policy, the Arctic, the Black Sea Basin, and uh, international politics in the Caucasus. And finally, to introduce our respondent for the afternoon, we have Dr. Lisa Chaldize, who has dedicated her work as a lawyer, educator, and author, and activist to the, to the development of the rule of law, as well as the defense of human rights. And I'm very eager to hear from all of our presenters and also from our respondent and from you after their presentations have ended. So thank you all for coming, and I will now turn it over to our first speaker. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to be back at Norwich and delighted to speak with you today. Um, my paper is going to consider this concept of Ukraine as a borderland. Um, it's often been considered sort of between east and west, and I'm going to present some of my ideas about that. Um, I'm going to focus, uh, given what's going on with this war, and I think most of us are sort of shocked by the scale and the brutality of this conflict that is going on right now. And um, a lot has been written about NATO expansion, European Union enlargement, Ukrainian neutrality. Uh, I'm not denying at all that these things are important, although I don't think that this war is about Ukrainian neutrality or NATO expansion at all, and that's something maybe we can discuss later. Um, I'm instead going to not deny that those things are important, but rather really focus on some of the important identity issues that I think give additional kind of context and perspective as to what's going on. So I'm going to focus on three main areas very quickly, given the constraints of time. I'm going to talk a little bit about two core uh, concepts that are within the current Russian national identity building project, and that is the concept of the near abroad, which is a way to characterize neighboring states, and the more recent concept of the Russian world. 
I'm then going to look a little bit at the Eurasian Economic Union project that is uh, led by Russia and the European Union project, which obviously is happening in um, the same space. And then finally, I'm going to look a little bit at some of the identity dynamics that we have seen, particularly since uh, 2014 with the uh, annexation occupation of Crimea, uh, particularly among um, Russian-speaking Ukrainians. And I want to say also, um, I think it's a very, very important point to underscore. When we talk about Russian-speaking Ukrainians, we're not talking about Russians who happen to be living in Ukraine. We're talking about Ukrainians who, for various reasons of history, um, have over time, Russian has become their native language, but they're not, they're not Russian, and I think that's an important point. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we got from the Soviet Union to uh, the so-called Russian world. Um, the Soviet Union, as Putin has sort of described as this enormous geopolitical catastrophe and tragedy for Russia, um, was actually led by Russia and some of the other states. So Boris Yeltsin as president of the Russian Federation, together with the presidents of Belarus and Ukraine, met together and dissolved the Soviet Union as a way to try to free up their republics to pursue the kinds of reforms that they wanted to pursue and that they felt that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was holding them back for. However, the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which they created to sort of, uh, to sort of replace the Soviet Union, was really underspecified, very vague, when it was agreed to as to how actually all of these things would operate um, in, not in principle, but really in detailed practice. And so pretty close after this, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, it became pretty clear that um, there would be really serious consequences for Russia um, for a number of reasons, strategic reasons, right? You've got bases that are now located in different states. Um, you've got different borders. You have all kinds of things that are happening. And so for this reason, I think it's not really surprising that uh, Russia has defined the former uh, Soviet republics as part of their special sphere of influence. And you know, there's a good amount of evidence that Yeltsin sort of assumed or had a vision that the Commonwealth of Independent States would operate pretty much the same as the Soviet Union. They would just get rid of communism, um, but that the Commonwealth would be strong, there would be a common mar a market, a common currency, sort of a unified military structure, but none of the other uh, republics of the Soviet Union were interested in that, um, and so the CIS being underspecified just never fulfilled that role. So Russia, um, in response, has tried to create sort of this uh, sphere, sphere of influence um, within the neighboring states. And initially, this wasn't such a big problem because Boris Yeltsin did respect the independence of neighboring states and followed a fairly um, liberal, sort of rules-based uh, foreign policy. But for a number of reasons, including perceived discrimination of Russian speakers abroad, particularly in the Baltic states, um, perceived sort of dismissal of Russia's national and security interests by the West, concerns about um, Russia being shut out of some kind of a European integration project, put a lot of pressure on Russia to turn to a more kind of nationalist-oriented foreign policy. And as the economic situation grew worse and the influence of the sort of liberal Western-oriented economist um, diminished, this pressure to kind of have a more um, strong focus on Russia's national interest emerged. Therein, we get this term called the near abroad, which emerged in mainstream discourse in 1993 when then Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev uh, laid out the tenets for a new Russian foreign policy concept. And um, the term in Russian has, uh, at least to, to my ear, has a sort of a connotation where the word for near kind of connotates a feeling of closeness that in turn gives this sort of distinction between territory that is abroad out there, that's a really truly sovereign uh, state, and these states that are kind of near us, and they aren't therefore fully sovereign. So to be kind of the close abroad means, well, you're technically kind of a sovereign state, but not really, right? This is how at least it appears to my ear. 
So Russian um, policy has been uh, to sort of assert a special role in this area, um, has, uh, has sort of asserted the right and the responsibility to exert special influence in these territories. And in fact, Russian policy has articulated the concept of compatriots um, as a category of non-citizens living outside of Russia who nonetheless go do under uh, a certain extent fall under Russian responsibility. And this is written into Russian law where they assert a special responsibility for these compatriots who are not living in Russia and are not Russian um, citizens. So even though this compatriot status may not be recognized and frankly isn't recognized by other states and is therefore pretty symbolic, um, it's pretty clear that this gives Russia a formal and um, systematic way to assert um, and potentially, as we see now, exert influence beyond its geographic boundaries. boundaries. Um, the compatriot policy also exists within this context of the Russian world, um, the Russian world concept, which posits Russia as a distinct civilization that transcends Russia's territorial borders. This Russian world uh, asserts that, that, that Russian civilization is a naturally in existing civilizational community. So Russia is not just Russian culture, Russian um, national identity is not part of European culture. It is a naturally separately existing civilizational um, identity. And um, it emphasizes the cultural basis of identity, which is rooted in Russian language and a shared Orthodox Christian uh, faith. The civilization shares a common past and is currently, according to Putin, who's been quite um, explicit about this, wrongfully and even perversely divided into separate states, which he says has resulted in the greatest divided nation on earth. So in this context, Ukraine and Belarus are seen not only as members of Russia's natural zone of special influence, but actually as integral pieces and integral parts of the Russian world based upon Eastern Slavic civilization, and they are not separate nations. And I'll come back to talk about that in a bit. So this um, kind of view of this natural uh, special role for Russia is obviously not shared by all states and certainly not by Ukraine, who has very consistently um, uh, been very steadfast, regardless of which political uh, party is in power, about Ukrainian um, sovereignty and independence. So let's talk a little bit about um, the European and Russian projects within this kind of what you might think of as the shared neighborhood. Um, Russia and EU, and again, I'm, I'm focusing on identity issues today. This isn't to ignore or discount the other material interest in economic inter integration. Um, I'm gonna focus on the identity issues. Russia and the EU have each asserted and defined a special role for themselves in this region that goes beyond their boundaries, that is based upon both economic interests and shared cultural values. Okay, so they're both doing sort of the same thing. I'm not equating between the two projects, obviously, but they're um, motivated by some of the same um, narratives. Each of these imagines a sort of normative cultural space that unifies populations beyond geographic borders and an economic zone that benefits from deeper economic integration. We have the um, European neighborhood policy, which was, uh, which was brought into place in 2004 because of, a, of an expansion of the European Union that required the European Union to start to think about um, making a, a formal relationship with states that now became on actual EU borders. And the idea behind the European, um, or the European neighborhood policy was to uh, include states from the former Soviet Union and also um, countries along the Mediterranean basis um, as in a regional engagement and cooperation policy. In 2009, an actual uh, specific policy ca called the Eastern Partnership was brought into place that had even more formal relations with the uh, East European states um, and were based upon uh, three different objectives. First was to accelerate political association to create more formal and, um, and strong political relations. Uh, second was to further economic integration. 
um, through association memberships and other economic agreements, and third, for providing for citizen mobility. Um, this would be in visa-free regimes and work permits. Um, and again, an idea of, of creating greater contact between those areas. Um, and I'm sorry, I went ahead too fast, but that's okay. We'll come back to this. Um, the goal of this uh, project was to build greater prosperity through interdependence and the creation of a free trade zone that requires East European participating states to meet EU standards for business, finance, banking, and trade. And the idea was that strengthening governance and increasing prosperity in the neighborhood and deepening regional integration would lead to greater stability and prosperity in the region. The problem that we have, um, however, is that this comes into direct conflict with um, Putin's plans for economic integration in the same exact neighborhood, uh, given that signing an association agreement with the European Union would preclude membership in the Europe, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and even if this was not the intention of the European Union, uh, this was indeed seen by Moscow as a, a direct effort to try to isolate Russia from its neighbors. Um, okay, gotta go fast. All right, so we're gonna go, we're gonna go beyond the European Union and I'll just jump in to talk a little bit about um, some of the identity issues. We have a lot of discussion about a so-called two Ukraines narrative, where the eastern part of Ukraine um, as Russian speaking and sort of geopolitically oriented towards Russia, the Western part of Ukraine is um, Ukrainian speaking and sort of geopolitically oriented towards the West. And there are a lot of reasons why this uh, narrative may or may not have been um, a, a fruitful or valid way of thinking about Ukraine in the past. Um, but certainly since independence, we've seen a very clear movement towards a civic model of national identity and not an ethnic model of national identity. We do have a little bit of a challenge because on the one hand, um, Ukraine has very clearly articulated a, na a national polity that is multilingual and multi-ethnic and cultural. It's civic in nature, right? It's inclusive. But on the other hand, the nation building project has been uh, based upon pr um, promoting the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. So we've got these two things happening at the same time. So we have seen some divisions since uh, independence. But what we have seen since 2014 um, with the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass is an increasing identity that is civic in nature based upon understanding Ukraine as a native language and um, identifying uh, uh, identifying Ukraine as the homeland and accepting Ukrainian language as the mother tongue, even if you don't speak the language. And this is a really important point. People will say, Ukrainian is my native language, whether or not they can speak Ukrainian. And this is because it has become, for them, uh, an identity marker. So I'm just gonna make three quick observations um, because it's a bit too early within this war. Um, I'd like to think that the war will be over tomorrow and we can start to draw conclusions. Um, but for now, I'd like to make three observations to toss out and maybe um, there might be interest in some discussion. The first is that I think that what we see with the um, incredible resistance that is happening in Ukraine today, where Russian speaking cities are being targeted ruthlessly Kharkiv is a Russian-speaking city. Mariupol is a Russian-speaking city. Kherson is a Russian-speaking city. And they are resisting, and they are saying, we are Ukrainian. So I think what we can see is that this whole Russian world concept is a complete and abject failure, first in soft power and now in hard power because they are not winning the war. Um, and I also observed that the two Ukraines concept, if it ever had any valid validity, is completely dead because obviously we are all one Ukraine. And I'd like to posit that I think we can stop thinking about Ukraine as a borderland. Um, if it ever was one, it certainly is not one any longer. So with that, I will finish. Thank you. All right, so I'm speaking to you on uh, the lessons that can be learned from uh, Russia's intervention in Syria. No, no PowerPoint. So I can go ahead and blank that one. There we are. Uh, let me first uh, offer the observation that uh, 
this would be a different presentation or the presentation would be received differently if this was being presented to you prior to February 24th. And so I would echo the caution of uh, Center for Naval Analysis uh, expert Michael Kaufman, who says prior to February 24th, we had a tendency to really overrate and over-exaggerate the Russian military, to say that they were 12 feet tall. And now because of the first uh, three weeks of the campaign in Ukraine, he says we have a tendency now to uh, go into an opposite direction, which is equally unhelpful, which is to think of the Russians as two feet tall. Uh, and one of the questions that may come out in our discussion is why some of the lessons that the Russians demonstrated in Syria, they did not apply in Ukraine. And is that a policy failure, an intelligence failure? Uh, is this just simply the bureaucratic reaction of most of the Russian military establishment that kind of pushed back against some of the innovative techniques that were being used in Syria and said, we don't want to apply them anywhere else, I think is something that we're still waiting to, to get more information on. Uh, I'd like to offer what I would call a triple disclaimer uh, in making my remarks. And the first, of course, since my day job is to work for the US Naval War College, uh, I am presenting here in a personal capacity. I'm not speaking on in, uh, on in any way on behalf of the US Navy, representing a US government position, uh, or even for that matter, relying on any US government uh, resources for my conclusions. Everything is based upon my own open source uh, analysis. Uh, the second disclaimer is uh, when you present on a topic like this and you say the lessons of Syria, uh, I'm doing this uh, as an analyst. Uh, we have a tendency now in the academic and scholarly worlds to confuse analysis and advocacy or to confuse analysis with approval. That is to say, if there are lessons to be learned from Syria, then therefore you must be saying, well, what the Russians did is good, or we should be, you are advocating for it. And instead, I simply want to look back, look at what the Russians have been doing since they intervened in Syria in 2015 uh, as a basis for us to understand uh, both is there a new paradigm for Russian intervention? Are there lessons that the US and allied militaries can learn? In some cases, we cannot apply those lessons because of our own rules of engagement and traditions of war fighting. Uh, but there may be lessons that may be applicable to us. And the final disclaimer is in presenting this kind of 30 or 60,000 foot view, uh, we can lose sight of the fact that in the end we're talking about human beings, whether in Syria or in Ukraine, particularly who are on the receiving end of violence. And so again, speak, when we speak very analytically about it, it may diminish, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, uh, this affects people directly in terms of being killed, being wounded, being driven from their homes, having their homes destroyed. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. All right. Basically, there are four lessons I think we should pull from the uh, Russian intervention uh, in Syria, and I think that they are important, particularly for the U.S. national security community, because the U.S. national security community, for the most part, got the Russian intervention into Syria wrong. Uh, when the Russians announced in September of 2015 that they were going to directly enter into the Syrian civil war, uh, the U.S. reaction first was to mirror image, and to say, well, Russia is not going to succeed in Syria because the United States has had problems in Iraq and Afghanistan. We assumed that the Russian intervention in Syria would mirror uh, the type of interventions that the US had been doing uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we also mirror imaged and assumed that a Russian intervention in Syria was more or less going to be a smaller scale repeat of the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan in 1979. And so based on that analysis, President Obama uh, felt relatively confident in predicting in September of 2015 that the Russian intervention would fail, Russia would be bogged down in a quagmire, this would strain uh, the Russian military, uh, this would strain the Russian economy, which already was under minor sanctions, and you saw from the first panel um, perhaps not really impactful sanctions on the Russian economy. Uh, and instead, we look at all the way to 2022, uh, and the, the picture in Syria uh, looked a lot different than it was being predicted. Uh, and then there are basically, so I want to go through what the four lessons were. The first is uh, that the Russians uh, had carefully studied U.S. interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Defense Minister, then Defense Minister Sergei Ivanov, who was remarking this in 2006, 2007, uh, that they were closely studying uh, the kind of successes and failures of U.S. counterinsurgency in Iraq. 
uh, what the U.S. was doing in Afghanistan, trying to, to get a sense of what things were working and what things were not. Uh, and the Russians, not unlike many American journalists who were observing both the Iraq and Afghan efforts, really picked up on um, the overreach of U.S. efforts. Uh, that the U.S. had established victory conditions in Afghanistan by the end of December, two, uh, December 2001, had effectively established victory conditions in Iraq by the end of 2003, but the mission had expanded, the mission grew, lots of new parameters came in, uh, all the way down to uh, you know, the United States military trying to set up a stock exchange in Iraq, uh, trying to set up media enterprises, uh, teaching Afghans how to use PowerPoint, on making sure that they were perfect PowerPoint rangers. Uh, and all of this kind of overreach developed and then prevented, uh, in the Russian view, uh, the U.S. from being able to establish conditions of victory on the ground militarily and then to use that uh, to either push forward a political settlement at best or stalemate uh, at worst. Uh, instead, the Russians in Syria have relied on what they call as a strategy of, quote, limited action. Uh, that is to not let mission creep come in or to start defining new goals. They went into Syria with two very explicit goals. One was to prevent Bashar al-Assad from being overthrown, uh, making sure that he was not driven out of Damascus, and the second was to ensure that he would remain a player in Syrian politics. Uh, those were the goals. The mission was geared to meeting those goals. Uh, it was geared to ensuring that at the end of the day, Assad stayed in Damascus and that he would remain a player in Syrian politics and by extension a player uh, in Middle Eastern politics. Um, the idea that the regime would be, quote, stable enough, not perfect, uh, not even necessarily having to control all of Syria. The extent to which Assad has regained control over Syria was not part of the original Russian mission set. Uh, it is a byproduct of the Russian intervention, but wasn't their uh, initial goal. And that meant you needed to secure the capital, you needed to secure certain lines of communications, you needed to secure strong points across the country, uh, but you did not need to have a presence in every village and hamlet uh, and entity in Syria in order to be able to, to influence the process. Second, uh, the Russian military in Syria, once it intervened, uh, focused on destroying capabilities and fighting capacity of the opposition, not, again, to occupy territory. Occupying territory was secondary to drawing out the opposition, drawing out their military uh, capabilities, drawing out their supply lines, and then using primarily air power with the judicious use of land power and some naval power uh, to, to bring that about. Um, and that, again, very important, not to occupy territory. Uh, instead, to use military force uh, to isolate and diminish points of resistance. Uh, and the Russians were therefore happy to uh, negotiate lots of uh, local settlements, uh, uh, basically along the lines, as long as you're not actively opposing us and Assad, we're not going to come in and really uh, interfere uh, with what you're doing. So ending up empowering a lot of local uh, authorities, particularly in Sunni villages, uh, and then of course the de facto relationship with the Kurds in Syria, uh, where the Kurds effectively have had a, uh, for the last uh, six years, have operated in a state of de facto truce with the Assad government. Uh, the third lesson uh, was the Russians uh, avoided the responsibilities of governance. This was something that they very much took from the U.S. experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also from the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. Uh, that once you begin to assume the responsibilities of governance, the mission expands, uh, and the ability for you to take on more uh, actions where the probability of failure increases or people perceive that you have failed because you have not delivered on governance. Um, Instead, again, uh, the Russians really pushed forward, uh, and sometimes even in opposition uh, to uh, people in the Assad government, who very much wanted to restore uh, as much Syrian government control over as much of Syria as possible, the Russians essentially saying, that's not our job here. Um, and I'm probably going to mangle the Arabic. Uh, but the, the, the Russians really pushed forward what were known as the uh, itifakwat uh, al 
uh, musalacha, these kind of uh, reconciliation agreements, uh, these deconfliction agreements. Uh, you go into a village, uh, you meet the, the real power brokers. This is something else the Russians learned from our experience in Iraq, that the official power holder may not, in fact, be the person who is really the mover and shaker. Uh, I think some of the people that I've talked to in the coalition provisional authority realized uh, after some time in Iraq that uh, politicians weren't really the movers. The, if they were Shia politicians, it was the Shia clergy, and that they were talking to the wrong people. Uh, they should have been talking to people in Najaf, not people who said, well, I represent this political party. Uh, and so the Russians went in, they would identify, and, and they did have some experience in this, uh, obviously, in how Chechnya was pacified, uh, both by uh, brutal tactics, but also by identifying power brokers and deciding how you can leverage them uh, in order to, to get them just simply to agree to stop fighting you. Um, and again, not worrying about governance, not worrying about democracy, not worrying about uh, can they operate PowerPoint or do they you know, meet a whole list of, of, of criteria or, or standards. Um, finally, uh, the Russians in Syria really focused on a light footprint in the sense of not sending in large amounts of ground forces, focusing primarily on air power, uh, some maritime uh, power, rotating land forces in, uh, using Syria, uh, and this was one of the things that I think the U.S. side did not pick up on was that essentially saying, well, instead of spending money from our exercise budget, we will use Syria to uh, exercise our, our forces. And so, uh, interestingly enough, and again, what we've seen in Ukraine raises some questions, but uh, essentially by uh, 2019, uh, pretty much all of the uh, regional commanders had rotated through Syria, a good chunk of the officer corps had rotated through Syria, almost all of the Russian Air Force pilots had gone through Syria at one point or another, so there was this sense of, but light footprint, never a large Russian contingent at any one point. Um, focusing on, as we've seen, use of a lot of indiscriminate firepower, right, not putting people on the ground, but instead uh, using air and artillery strikes uh, to substitute for uh, people and to use that as a strategy, the siege and starve strategy. Um, and some of the Russian generals are very explicit. We don't want to fight block for block in a place like Aleppo. We would rather create conditions that make Aleppo unlivable so that the opposition leaves and then we can move in after. Finally, and probably most critically, what we've seen in Syria is the use of uh, militias and mercenaries, which I think is uh, really speaking to some changes that we may be seeing in mid-21st century warfare. Uh, recruitment, uh, particularly from some of Russia's ethnic minorities to go into Syria. Uh, very effective Chechen and English units. Uh, again, part of the reason that uh, in some cases the, these Russian uh, Muslim nationality units uh, were better at reaching these deals with Sunni leaders than uh, Alawite uh, army commanders in Syria or Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard commanders uh, because they could play on a common Sunni heritage. Uh, but most importantly and critically has been the, the rise of the private uh, military companies, relying on private military companies, uh, both uh, as a strategy for uh, keeping down your uniformed casualties for fear that that might create uh, problems at home, uh, giving you a degree of plausible deniability uh, to, to operate and to act. Uh, and when necessary, um, mercenary companies, uh, if their actions become uh, problematic, they can be abandoned, as we saw uh, in 2018, um, where mercenary companies clashing with uh, the US uh, essentially were left to their own, their own fate. So with that, we have these lessons. Prior to the start of the invasion of Ukraine, there was a sense both in the Russian strategic community and also in the American strategic community that Syria was paving a way forward for how Russia would intervene. Uh, what we're now seeing in Ukraine is calling into question whether that is uh, correct or not. So I think we'll still be debating the lessons of Syria, uh, but also determining whether or not uh, this reflects a fundamental change in how the Russian government plans to use the military instrument of, state, of statecraft and how it links with uh, its diplomatic and economic efforts.
Good afternoon. Um, the the title of this of this presentation was offered to the organizers um, last fall, I think, uh, because at that time I, I I I was expecting a war between Russia and Ukraine, and I was thinking about writing something, presenting something to explain why was why war was likely between Russia and Ukraine. Um, I've written about this since um, Ru Russia's potential conflicts with Georgia and Ukraine since 2007, um, after Mr. Putin made a, a lengthy presentation at the Munich um, Security Conference uh, in February of 2007, in which he pretty much outlined his, his plan, what he intended to do. Um, in, in coming decades. Um, was not taken seriously. That was an important watershed in, um, in, Ru in Russia's foreign policy towards its neighbors. Um, uh, and uh, the next important event was the recognition of Kosovo as an independent state against um, uh, Russian objections. And following after that, summer of 2008, uh, Georgia and Ukraine were um, candidates of joining NATO. Uh, they themselves believed they were candidates, but a NATO summit in Bucharest refused to grant them uh, accession uh, papers, like a plan to become uh, NATO members at some point in the near future, specifically because of uh, German and uh, French objections. Uh, even though the U.S. administration under Mr. Bush supported the plan and the U.K. supported it as well. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, this is August 2008, and, and Russia invades Georgia. Um, I'm not going to take much of your time. I can answer your questions um, if you have questions about this. Uh, my uh, a paper more extensive than my presentation, obviously, but the argument is very simple. Um, the United States and Western allies have been pursuing policies of appeasement to Russia since 2007, and that is a um, direct cause of the war in Ukraine, uh, among other things, such as the, um, um, the, the outdated state of uh, American strategic arsenal and inability of Europeans to find a common ground when it comes to uh, policies um, to, to, to their Russian policies. Um, so, uh, it, or general line of reasoning here is that um, neither Georgia or Ukraine represents a direct threat to Russia. They're smaller countries. They don't really pose any significant cultural or religious or any other economic or political security threats. Uh, Russian objective here is to defeat NATO. That's Mr. Putin's personal objective and the people who are around him helping him in, in this quest. So the, the final, Ukraine is not the final step. The final step is attacking a NATO country, um, more or less insignificant country. I, I, I don't want to speak in these kinds of terms, but I, I want to communicate to you Russian thinking about this a more marginal NATO member, um, causing significant damage to the country. And if uh, NATO fails to respond, especially the United States fails to respond in a decisive manner. And may I, may I also mention that sanctions are not decisive any, any, um, in any significant way. In the Russian thinking, sanctions are actually a sign of capitulation. Uh, sanctions tell them we, we are not going to fight. You can go ahead and do whatever. We are not going not to use force. That's how they hear this in Moscow. Um, so once Russia attacks, um, 
you, you pick a country uh, on, the, on the periphery of NATO and NATO fails to respond, that's the end of NATO. And that's the end of US influence um, and uh, uh, prestige and power in Europe and that the game is done. So on this path, and it's coming, um, Ukraine has been significant in this, in this uh, process because Ukraine has managed to, um, to make Russia stumble, which no one expected, including the American administration, as if, if, we, we, are, if we are to believe what they're telling us from the screens of television. The Russian government didn't expect it either. Um, invading, you know, initially they deployed about 68 battalions um, in, um, to Ukraine, um, and that number increased dramatically uh, after a few days. So they had fuel about, for about three days of operation. Uh, one battalion, Russian battalion, needs about two uh, fuel trucks for operation per day. And, and they didn't have enough fuel initially to, to, to sustain long-term operation. But that now has changed. So here I am uh, presenting you a map of Georgia. Georgia is a small country. As the population is under 4 million. And the size of Georgia, uh, it's a smaller than state of Maine. Uh, it's not a large country. Uh, Russia is a northern neighbor. Turkey south, uh, Azerbaijan and Ukraine southeast. In the west, what you see is the Black Sea. And the Black Sea connects Georgia also with Ukraine and, and Russia. And we are going to come to that. I'm showing you a physical, physical map of Georgia because physical geography especially in warfare and also in diplomacy is very important. And normally when they present you maps, they present you with um, a flat, um, you know, colored uh, shapes that don't tell you much. Uh, and then they can attach any information to it they want you to believe. For instance, the idea that Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, could fall it could fall in three days. Uh, now, if you were to imagine Kiev is larger than Chicago, and even if no one resists uh, surrounding and taking Chicago in three days, it's just an unbelievable idea. But a city that well is, is, is well defended like Kiev is, is just crazy. If you imagine Kiev to be a, a little spot on the map, then you can imagine that. But if you, if you realize how large the city is, it's quite difficult to understand why would uh, someone tell you that. Now, that's the Caucasus Mountains geography. Uh, you see their elevation and the, and the, and the mountain, Mount Kazbegi. Our Canadian friends will see this five kilometers. That's the border between Georgia and Russia. So the, for the Russia to invade Georgia, it had two options, to cross the mountains, which you understand tall mountains are not easy to cross, impossible to helicopters to fly over and invade from the sea. So the war started on, um, there is a dispute about this, uh, August 7 or 8. We are going to come to that, why there is a discrepancy. But, <coughs> excuse me, um, Russia invaded both from the north and from the sea. From the sea was significant because Russia had no coastal defenses, no none whatsoever. The United States ga gave them rubber boats and some rifles to defend the coastline. And uh, uh, Georgia had no significant amount of <clears throat> um, um, air defenses, air force, um, artillery, no significant amount of anything to defend itself, even though as you heard from the ambassador this morning, Georgia was probably one of the most pro-American, still it remains one of the mostly American-oriented states in the world. There was a lot of talk, and there is a lot of talk about strategic partnership between the United States and Georgia, but realistically, United States or anyone else uh, didn't arm or help Georgia in any significant way, just like they didn't arm or help Ukraine in any significant way before the invasion. 
So there are two roads leading from uh, Russia to Georgia that could be could be taken by any any anyone, including the armed invading armed forces. And the and the battle that waged was north and central Georgia. Uh, the the town is there is called Skinwali. And the Georgian army resisted the invading Russian force as much as they could uh, coming from the mountains. Black Sea Fleet was late joining the war. They came three days late. And they landed on a post, amphibious assault on the Georgian coast. And once it is landed, it was useless to mount resistance anymore because the Georgian army risked to be surrounded. So the strength of the Russian army is to on the on the flatlands. Once they they are useless in the mountains, they, they ha have a hard time fighting in the mountains. But as you see, the green shades, those are flatlands. Those could be transversed very very quickly, very effectively by mechanized infantry. So Georgia asked for peace, and a peace was peace agreement was signed um, after five days of fighting. Um, the number of factors contributed. To, to that, why war ended so quickly. Number one, Russian army wasn't ready. And the Russians realized it themselves because um, a couple of entrepreneurial Georgian <clears throat> artillery commanders engaged Russian forces and, and did significant damage to them. Russian aircraft were shut down. And, uh, and they realized that the, the supply lines were not functioning. <clears throat> Historically, Russian army supply lines are in terrible shape. Anyway, so they were not ready. And at the same time, there was a force, forceful diplomatic intervention by the United States. <coughs> so appeasement is actually a theoretical concept in international relations. M most people who think about appeasement think about uh, Chamberlain and the Hitler. It's not only that, but uh, Western governments have pursued appeasement policies towards um, uh, North Korea, for instance. Um, the U.S. policy to Russia, appeasement policy, actually had a name. It was called Reset, presented by um, uh, Secretary um, Clinton to um, Foreign Minister Lavrov on, uh, soon after the war was over. So this is a wider view of uh, uh, the region. And the, the Russian objective here is to control the Black Sea. That why had they have been uh, obsessed with Crimea and, and Georgia? Sevastopol is the key. Is the key um, for for Russian control over the Black Sea and the Mediterranean access to Mediterranean Sea. <coughs> One of the key documents that allowed appeasement policy to proceed both by Europe and the United States was this report published by the European Union a year after the war ended and actually blamed Georgia for attacking Russia inside Georgia. And the, Georgia was bl blamed for um, opening of this, of this war. Um, one of the Russia's objective just like now, was demilitarization of uh, Georgia. And they have achieved this objective by um, not allowing or lobbying Western powers not to rearm Georgia for, for self-defense. And um, one, of the, one of the most outrageous steps was that the Georgia resisted Russian accession to WTO, World Trade Organization. And the Western partners pressed the Georgian government to concede, to allow Russia to be, become a member of the WTO. Um, if you imagine that, um, um, so the idea was that the, uh, uh, Georgia started the war, and the Russian army, and about 30,000 of them were passing by in the Caucasus Mountains and just, just came across. The border is, uh, is, is incredible claim, but that's what the European Union published in 2009. Um, the 
according to Russian sources, they were in Georgia on August the 7th of 2008. And other sources claimed that to be in Georgia just after midnight, 2008, uh, August 8, 2008. So <coughs> here are some of the pictures. This is a Russian accession to WTO. You see this gentleman there uh, holding a, a shirt, mission accomplished. George Bush's favorite words. Um, here is Mr. Lavrov with Mrs. Clinton holding a reset button, which was misnamed uh, in Russian. In Russian, actually, it said overload instead of reset. And that's why they're laughing. Uh, so uh, Lavrov's surprise was, what, what are we overloading? And they said, well, no, it's not overload. It's reset, OK? And this is Mr. Medvedev. And what, that was actually the caption you read, a successful reset button. So in, 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 in short, reset policy started by outgoing Bush administration and continued by Clinton. Trump didn't care about either about Ukraine or Georgia. And here we are. So uh, the war with Ukraine, what changed? What, what changed was that I think European friends finally realized that Russia is going west. You see, Georgia and Crimea, they're south. The west is different, right? West is Europe. So I think now they, they think themselves as the next target, which is, which is going to happen or sooner or later. Thank you. Hello, thank you all for being here. I see classes changing right about now. Um, so we've heard some fascinating things today. I do have a few follow-up questions. Uh, if I could start, please, with Dr. Kaczewski. I noticed um, that in your talk, the identity issue was really sort of the core. And what I'm wondering is, uh, many, many years ago, back in 1979, I was in Kiev and then went outside the city to a rather eerie forest where people had remembered their loved ones Roughly two million people had died in a famine engineered by Stalin, people in the Ukraine, I mean. And in this forest, even then, all those years later, you could see these rotting wooden boards nailed to trees with the name of a loved one on it. And it was quite ghostly, quite moving. What I'm wondering is your view on the extent to which historical memory in Ukraine either impacts or does not impact the question of Ukrainian identity, and if so, the extent to which that is equally true in the Russian-speaking areas. Are we going to do one, yeah, uh, one at a time? So. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? No. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I'm writing a book on this, so I'll have to remember to send you a copy when I finally Please finish do. it. Um, I think that historical memory is one of those um, key points on the kind of identity boundary that I have identified that is a sticking point with regional differences. It's very difficult, for example, and I'm talking before the war, I think now this is going to change. I, my hypothesis is, but that'll be a, a different book. Um, I think that it is very difficult for anyone who is above, say, the age of 30, 35, to accept that um, Bandera is a national hero in Kharkiv. This was difficult. Younger people saying, OK, you renamed the war. It's no longer the Great Fatherland War. It didn't go from 1941 to 1945. It started in 1939. No problem. 
Western Ukraine was part of Poland then. This is all a misunderstanding. Let's be open to some different interpretations. But it's very difficult for people who have any historical connection to the war. My grandfather fought in the war. My grandfather fought to liberate, and the Red Army, to liberate us from the Nazis. And those guys out there were traitors, and I can't revisit that. So there were certain pieces, I think, of historical memory that are um, difficult to get agreement on, but uh, that's not unique to Ukraine. I mean, we have regional differences in how we remember history in the United States as well. Um, so I do think that, that conversations about history are difficult. The nation building project that I touched on, which has focused very much on official interpretations of history, Ukrainian language, this, this, and this, has not necessarily fit closely, I think, with where a lot of people in Odessa, and, and particularly in Kharkiv, where I did my studies, fit. I think now there might be a, a willingness to revisit some of those questions because Bandera seems a lot less menacing <laughs> to the Ukrainian nation. But definitely historical memory has been very, it hits people in their heart. It hits people where that is my family that you're talking about. You know, If you're old enough to have a grandparent who was alive during the war, you still care about it, for sure. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And jumping now to Dr. Chan Toridza, um, I have actually been to the refugee camp on the supposed new border within Georgia along the, the military line that is guarded by Russian military and also heavily landmined. This is after uh, Russia grabbed Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and I use the word grab as not really a term of art, but you know what I mean. Um, and again, like Ukraine, Georgians have a really intense national identity and in a, a culture that is truly ancient. So on a sort of similar note, I actually have two questions. Um, one, given the strength of Georgian resolve and yet a sort of lack of Western resolve, if I might put it that way, when it comes to Georgia, um, my two questions are, one, is how important is the invisible aspect of Georgian resolve in history? For example, even under Stalin, Georgia pushed back to preserve Georgian as the, the state language of Georgia, even when it was a Soviet republic. So I'm wondering about the role of both Western and Georgian resolve and also, in your remarks, if I understood correctly, you seemed to be attributing a, a rather high level of rationality to Putin wanting to defeat NATO and so forth. <clears throat> what I'm wondering is, to what extent, if any, do you think that Putin's personality or ego might be playing a role here with the irrational goal of reinstituting the Russian Empire. OK, so about Georgian resolve. Uh, Georgians have been around for a long time, <laughs> as you well know. Uh, they, uh, uh, Tbilisi, capital city, Tbilisi was between the 7th and between the 8th and the 11th century was held by the Arabs. So the Georgians slowly undermined their rule and finally expelled them in the 11th century. So 300 years, and that was the 11th century. So they can wait, and they can, they can outlive the Russians. There is no question about it. <clears throat> They're not going anywhere. Um, but um, in, um, in, immediate, in the immediate future, they will likely remain on the Russian heel, because Russia is not going anywhere next couple of decades. Um, sorry, what was your second uh, question? The extent to which the personality or ego of Putin to want to reconstitute the Russian Empire. No, he, he doesn't want to reconstitute the Russian Empire. That, that's a misconception. <clears throat> he wants to get rid of NATO. He wants to get rid of the so-called uniponer world. And Putin's rise to power is, starts from the war in Kosovo. 
NATO Yugoslavia war, where NATO attacked Yugoslavia, claimed there was a genocide, bombed Belgrade and other cities in Yugoslavia. And that's when Stalin, uh, excuse me, Yeltsin, President Yeltsin was given an ultimatum either to resign and find, find a replacement or face a coup by generals, um, especially, specifically General Iwashov and his bodies who actually organized a special operation to rescue uh, Pristina, uh, uh, Kosovo. So that's when um, um, Mr. Putin was found. Okay. As, as, as the head of the F FSB, yes. he took, he took his, one of his goals from the very beginning was to, to, to push NATO back, to destroy NATO. Okay, thank you for that, I appreciate it. And finally, Dr. Gvozdov, a quick question. Do you see any role for nation building in American foreign policy? I think that it, would, it needs to rest first on a strong domestic foundation of support. I think that Americans have to be convinced that their own economic political or economic technological energy security rests upon the nation building enterprise. Uh, obviously the United States has since the end of the Cold War been uninterested in nation building in large chunks of the world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa um, and then in other places. I think that in the Middle East there was a sense that this would be done relatively quickly and easily um, and then you know, Americans soured on, on that experience uh, and I think that's one reason why uh, up till now this sense that the Russians were quote more successful in Syria was that they were explicitly not engaged in nation building they were engaged in in regime survival uh, moving forward you know your question also hits on something we're talking a lot about Ukraine today and Ukraine resistance uh, and, and you can't find in, you know, we, we had the governor here this morning talking about it and, and all of that. The question is going to be the American domestic uh, will to fund Ukrainian reconstruction with the same degree of fervor as mm -hmm. providing military aid to Ukraine, because that's going to be the critical question. I mean, even if the Russians leave tomorrow, the damage that's been done in Ukraine, the geoeconomic damage alone is, is pretty considerable. Um, and are you going to see Americans saying, I'm happy to fund that? And, and you know, I, I mentioned this in a class of mine, and he's in the committee room, and he's saying to everyone, you know, I want 100 million for schools. And the rest of the committee says, you know, why do we want to build schools in Afghanistan? He said, you were willing to do half a billion for military aid, but not to put that in. And so I think that will be, that's going to be the real test, because if we don't have that, that your, your question will be answered next year when the Ukraine Freedom Reconstruction Act is stalled in committee uh, and doesn't move. Um, and Georgia has already experienced this. Poor Moldova, which got stuck under Jackson Vanek for 20 years and couldn't escape it because that bill could never leave committee. So um, I'd say the jury's out on that. Thank you very much. Thank you all for such a rich and thought-provoking conversation. Um, I would like to now, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to invite anyone from the audience who'd like to ask a question of the panel, uh, please come down to the microphones right here. And uh, what we'll do is, given the short amount of time, I'd like to have uh, maybe the first few people who can ask a question, ask a question, panelists will think about it, we'll, have, we'll field another couple of questions, and then, we'll, um, and then we'll let the panelists kind of tackle them all as a concluding comment on this session. So please come on down um, and feel free to, uh, to ask a question of our, of our panelists. And as, as we're waiting for that, I, I also just want to invite other panelists. Uh, so, Professor Chaldeze, thank you so much for just starting the conversation. Um, and I want to invite our other panelists to answer questions that Professor Chaldeze directed to others. So if you heard a question that she asked and you really want to take it up, please feel free. And you can think about that, and let's start here, and then we'll go here. This question is for Dr. Vozdev. Um, you said that in Syria, the Russians were using a lot of militia. But 
the reason for that was to provide plausible deniability and to distance themselves from the, the inevitable casualties that did come. Yeah. My question, though, what did that actually look like in Russia when hundreds of Russian Russian backed militias died? Uh, it was portrayed as this is the life they've chosen, right? This is the business they've chosen. They knew the risks. They took the job. It may be regrettable for the mothers and the families, but it was not seen as something where Russian honor had to be avenged. If they had been, you know, with the patch and regular members, that pressure might have been greater. That that has been an important part we see, kind of particularly with the Wagner group, but with others, is the public perception is dangerous work, uh, heroic perhaps, but it, that's the profession that they've chosen, and they knew the risks going in. So that's one reason we've seen now. Uh, in Ukraine, um, the shift now towards moving back towards militias and mercenaries um, as opposed to certainly to conscripts um, as, as a basis for moving forward. So um, because there is that. And, and by the way, we see that in the U.S. as well. You know, we, don't, we don't treat the deaths of contractors as the same level as, as, as members of the volunteer force. And I think the Russians internalize that. So. Can I ask a follow-up? Can we come over? Can we come over here first, and then and stay stay right there, please. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, excuse my uh, my English, not my mother language. So uh, English, uh, excuse my English, if it's uh, wrong or anything. Um, with the fall of the USSR, uh, we've seen the fall also of the Warsaw Pact, mm -hmm. and on the other side, NATO continued existing. Not only did it continue existing, but it kept expanding as the EU. So my question is. Uh, do you feel like uh, we failed to understand uh, Russia's per uh, Russian perception of NATO as a threat or as uh, um, kind of uh, failed to understand their vital uh, territory that they have to preserve or that NATO is just for them not necessary for the defense or the uh, international order? Here, yeah, I, I can take a stab at that. Um, it's a long, complicated <coughs> answer, so I'll be quick, about. right? I don't, I mean, we could talk for a long time. Um, I think that the problem that we have is that from the Western perspective, NATO has written into the treaty this concept of an open door, which says European countries, if you want to join and you meet this criteria, this is, this is a possibility. And to say that, oh, European countries, you can do that unless somebody else vetoes your sovereign decision is sort of saying not everybody is sovereign. And that's against Western sort of, um, I think, value system. And so there's that uh, from the one side. I think also from the Western perspective, um, we view NATO as a defensive alliance. And it's not at all designed or intending to attack Russia. And so therefore, there's no problem with um, enlargement. From the Russian side, however, it's quite different. And I think that um, part of the problem is Russians really, really believe, and this may or may not be true because the Americans have denied it and denied it and denied it, but in the end it doesn't matter if it's true or not because everybody in Russia <laughs> believes. It's, yeah, everybody in Russia believes that, that when Gorbachev agreed that a, a, a reunified Germany could remain in NATO, that they were promised NATO would not expand. So whether or not we made that promise and the Americans have sworn up and down that that's not true, it's not true, it's not true. The Russians think it's true. And the fact that they think it's true is that they believe that they have somehow been tricked or you know they made the mistake to agree about Germany. And, and therefore, they've got very strong suspicions about NATO. The problem is, how do you address Russian suspicions without violating the integrity of the principle of having a defensive alliance Right, and so I think that this is where we where we find ourselves. But certainly, from the Russian perspective, this is very problematic, um, and the Baltic states more more than ever. I don't know if you wanted to add. Just, just briefly, I mean, look, part of the problem with NATO enlargement problem is let me back that up. Then, not a problem, but one of the ways it was pitched, it was pitched differently to three different constituencies. Mm -hmm. So it was pitched to. Western Europeans as this is no problem because Russia is either finished as a great power or it won't care. It was pitched to the American taxpayer as all these new members are going to come in and America will pay less. And the countries coming into NATO said, we know our history. <laughs> we know that there are cycles of rise and fall. 
in the east and we want to be on the right side of the line because the line will come back again. And I, po politically squaring that was the issue. By 2002, we, and this is the road not taken, we had both the, with NATO and the EU mechanisms for relationship with Russia, the NATO-Russia Council, and then the EU wider neighborhood, uh, the four common spaces with Russia. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, the Russian intransigence in some areas, uh, Europeans and Americans not taking it as seriously as they might have, those roads for kind of squaring this circle were lost. I mean, I would argue 2002, 2003, we had opportunities to, to, to perhaps move this uh, in a different direction. And, you know, um, partly that had to do with, you know, the U.S. decision to go into Iraq, which created rifts in the transatlantic relationship and d distracted the U.S. from European security because we said it's done, um, but again, this is all water under the bridge now. But for those who say this is inexorable, because in the first panel, the Mearsheimer question came up, which, you know, leaving that aside, the idea that this was inexorable from 1991, we could only get to where we are in 2022, no, we had many ways in which this could have handled, and some of it is, you know, and the blame goes around. It's no, uh, you know, Moscow's unwillingness to accept post-imperial status is one, and lack of attention in Washington is another, and European, Western European kind of indifference to some of these issues is a third, in I my opinion. I add one tiny thing. I know we're really short on time. And let's not forget that Kosovo, right? So we had the NATO-Russia Council, and then we decided to bomb Serbia without talking to Russia. So Russia's like, who cares about the NATO-Russia Council? I mean, honestly, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna make strategic decisions without discussing it. Thank you. Let's come back here. On the Russian militia again, so how does the relationship look like between the Russian military leaders who are commanding the war and employment of, of militias like the Wagner Group? Well, in Syria, and one reason why the Russian military was willing to let Wagner get whacked the way that they did was that the general staff was, was really ticked off at some of the things Wagner was doing and were happy to let the American Air Force teach Wagner a lesson, right? So you have those rivalries. What we see today in Ukraine, um, if these reports are correct, that you know the rivalry between the FSB and, and Kadyrov's people, that the employment of the, of the Chechen groups in, in Ukraine has led to a, and that you know, if, the, if we take this report, that you know, elements of the FSB tipped off uh, Zelensky through their contacts in the SBU that a, a Chechen hit squad was coming for, uh, Zelensky and enable that to be ambushed. Yeah, there is the, 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 there's there's tension, right? Because, you know, this also reflects. We had, you know, Tom. Tom is the famous author of the clans, uh, <laughs> but you know, but within the security and military services, there are clans, there are rivalries, and they're not all necessarily one big happy family. So, yeah, Wagner and Prigozhin's people, um, the millet. Some people in the military said he's getting too big for his britches, and he's trying to take control of some Syrian oil assets. So. Um, no, we're going to withdraw that protective air cover over him and, you know, let him take the 400 guys getting um, schwacked there in um, eastern Syria. I wonder if we could... Official military term. We have about a minute left. I wonder if uh, Professor Chandri say if we could get a... If you yeah. care to comment on any of those questions or conversations. Thank you. I appreciate that. My perspective is sort of different than the experts on the panel here. I look at things from a human rights point of view, and I wonder to what extent the U.S. may again step up and sort of actively, candidly profess to morality within its foreign policy. This is not really responsive to any particular question, but I do think it's relevant. I have been urging that the U.S. once again take the position of defending the defenders, that is, those people within countries who are risking death by torture every day for the greater good to defend the rights of others, the rights of strangers. On a for what it's worth basis, I predict that President Biden perhaps quite soon will in fact reincorporate that into American policy, which is something we haven't really seen since the 70s. On a final note, in regard to Ukraine, 
there are also many Russian refugees, hundreds of thousands at this point, who are fleeing Russia because of the risk they are at. Um, by the way, if you use the word war in relation to Ukraine within Russia, you can get up to a 15-year sentence for calling that nasty little conflict a war. So I would hope that people will also be alert to the impact within Russia of uh, its own aggression against Ukraine. Thank you. Everyone, please join me in thanking our panelists for this wonderful conversation. And thank you all for coming.